Okay, so let me review a few of the things we've looked at up to this point, and then we'll combine them in a new way. So um, one is we have this long exact sequence. When you're given some subspace A inside of X, and we talked about A being a nice subspace, um, but in general, if A is some subspace of X that meets some very niceness criteria, then we have this long exact sequence of homology that Hn of A maps to Hn of X. This is just induced by the inclusion map. And then this maps into the relative homology Hn of x rel a, and you can think this is induced by something like a quotient map. And then this maps back to h, but now you lower it by 1, n minus 1 of a, and this maps a little bit harder to define. I think we had to denote it by delta, if I remember correctly. Um, so we have this long exact sequence, and this, this continues, you know, infinitely far um, to the left and down to 0 on the right. And so being exact means that the um, kernel of one of these maps is equal to the image of the prior, right? So, so this is our exactness here. OK, that's a long exact sequence. Good, remember that? We also had a special theorem called excision. Our excision theorem, so I think we're going back two or three lectures now, where the picture now you should think is you have some space x, and inside of x you have some space a, and inside of a you have some space z. So z is a subset of a, is a subset of x, where again we have some niceness criteria. In particular here we want to make sure that z is really contained in a, so we say the, interior, uh, the closure of z is inside the interior of a which you should think that it's saying that z doesn't come up right to the edge of a, there's like a gap, right, between z and the edge of a. Or you can put z inside of some open set where that's inside of a, but here the closure of z is inside the interior of a, the buffer between the edge of z and a. And where you have this, we then have that the inclusion map that just includes the space x minus a into x, and that includes, I'm sorry, not x minus a, x minus z into x, and that includes um, a minus z, there we go, a minus z into a, so you can think of including this pair into this pair, induces an isomorphism. What is going on with the letters of the alphabet today? Okay, induces an isomorphism so that Hn, the induced map, so, so if this is some map i, there will be some induced map on homology that will send x minus z rel a minus z into the homology group Hn of x rel a, and I'm saying that in fact that gives you an isomorphism for all n, for all n greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that was excision. There's another way we can dress up excision. So there's an equivalent form of excision. That is gonna be particularly handy for us today where instead of thinking of z inside of a inside of x, we'll show it's equivalent to this, but you're going to begin thinking of your space x as being partitioned, so, so here's, here's x, this whole thing's x, but I'm going to think that x has two subsets, one that is some subset x1, and the other is some subset x2, or as I should say, subspace x1 and x2. So we have x1 and x2 both inside of x, such that my um, 
interior, such that the interior of x1 union the interior of x2 comprises all of x. Okay, so, so there's something analogous here you can kind of think through, but this is saying that you know, x1, x2, they overlap a little bit, so there'll be some overlap here, there'll be some intersection of them. Here in the middle, you can think you have some x1 intersect x2, but the point is they cover x. The interiors of them cover x. Um, it's not like one just comes up to the edge of the other, they actually have some meaningful overlap in covering x. Okay. If this is your setup, then the inclusion that you get from including x1 into x and x1 intersect x2 into just x2 make sure I wrote that right, right, induces, a, a high, induces an isomorphism. between the homology groups. So you get that Hn of x1 rel, the intersection of x1 of x2 is isomorphic with Hn of x rel x2 for all n. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so, so how do you see that these are equivalent? Like how do you go from this representation to this representation? Well, I mean this is kind of giving away that my A over here is just going to be x2, right? So, so think of this whole x, okay, so I should have done that in yellow because I wrote x2 in yellow. So my A is going to be x2. But then you're like, well that means over here a minus z should be this intersection, right? And x minus z should be x1. So then it's like, what is z? Well, well, maybe this gives it away. That means your z is just going to be x minus x1. Your z is x minus x1. So maybe I should grab another color. Uh, I don't think I've used orange yet. Z is x minus x1. So in this picture, my Z is just this little bit right here. Right? This, this is Z for me. It's just the part of x2 that doesn't have x1. So you could think of it as x minus x1, but that's the same. Alternatively, you can think of it as x2 minus x1. Because if you get rid of all the x1 part, you're just left with a bit of x2 that doesn't overlap with the intersection. Or you can think of it as x2 minus the intersection. Okay, this is all equivalent, right? So, so that's where your z is. And, and then you just like convince yourself that this is the right thing. So like, what is x minus z? x minus z is then x1. So that's not hard to see, which by definition, x minus z will be x1. And then what is a minus z? So take a second to think about like a minus z. A minus z is saying, well, it's everything in x2 minus, <laughs> so this is kind of weird, it's everything in x2 minus everything that's in x2 that's not in x1. Everything that's in x2 that's not in x1. But that's just saying it's everything that's in x2 that's also in x1. So that's the same thing as saying x1 intersect x2. So these are equivalent. So all, all I did was I was just being strategic in, in uh, rewriting these spaces. So instead of thinking of excision as this statement, today we're going to think of this being my statement of excision. Okay. So we have a long exact sequence and we have this relationship from excision. One more fact I'll note. We also have a commutative diagram. Uh, 
And in a second, we're going to put this all together. So I'm just listing all the ingredients right now. Uh, commutative diagram, you can think if you have x1 intersect x2, this can be included into either x1 or x2, right? So I'll, I'll create some maps. I'll call this map j1, which just includes x1 intersect x2 into x1. And this will be j2 will be the map that includes it into x2. But then your x1 and your x2 are both subspaces of x. So you could also include this into just x, or you could include this into just x. And we'll call this the inclusion map I2, because it includes x2, and this the inclusion map I1. And I'm just pointing out that this diagram is commutative, that is to say, I1 composed with J1 should give you the same thing as I2 composed with J2. And, and there's like no surprise here, because they're just saying if you start out with something in x1 and intersect x2, and you first stick it in x1 and then you stick it in x, that's the same thing as if you stick it in x2 and then stick it in x. Right? This is something in the intersection. So either way, you can pass it into x and still the same thing in x. Right? So, so this being commutative, there's nothing deep going on here. It's just thinking of what inclusion does. But so we have this, this um, commutivity of that diagram. Okay. I want to take all of these properties now and put them together. So, note, we have two long exact sequences. This is just coming from here on top. For the first one, I'm going to have my x be x1 and the subspace A be the subspace x1 intersect x2. So, um, I'm just following it exactly. If I have x1 intersect x2, there's an inclusion map that includes that into just x1. And then I can, there's a quotient map that sends that, something like a quotient map, that sends that to x1 rel x1 intersect x2. And then there's this strange boundary map that sends us back to x1 intersect x2. But now homology is one lower, so it's hn minus one of x1 intersect x2. And, and the story goes on. And if you wanted to extend the story further to the left, here you would have like an hn plus one of x1. And the story goes on to the left as well. Um, I, let me go ahead and la label these maps. So this x1 to the intersection. Oh, 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 what did I do here? Thank you. This, this is hn plus 1 of x1 rel x1 intersect x2. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's the pattern. Okay. So we said x1 intersect x2 included in x1 is called j1. So really this should be j1 star, but I'm going to get tired of writing stars all the time. So I'm just going to call j1 by an abusive notation. Um, this is some kind of quotient map, so I'll just call it q. Um, this over here is this weird boundary map, I'll call it delta. Uh, delta star, but I'm not going to want to keep writing stars every time. And this is also some boundary map. And if we need to distinguish these, you know, we could call this delta n plus 1, and we can call this delta n. But again, I'll get tired of doing that, so I'll just stop at some point. Okay. So there's, there's a long exact sequence. When our space x was x1, and our space a, the subspace, was the intersection. That's one way you could do it. Another way we can do this is we can make the space... Um, be just x. So instead of x being x, we want to make x just x. So x is going to be just x. So we're going to have hn of the space x. And the subspace I'll consider is the subspace x2. So again, we get a long exact sequence where x2 includes into x by some map j2. And then it gets mapped to relative homology 
hn of x rel x2. And then, so, so this probably needs some name. Here I call it q, I guess here I can call it q star, uh, q prime. And then here you're going to be sent back to the subspace x2 via some weird boundary map. So I'll call it boundary prime to denote where on the second guy. You might want to denote this is the nth one. And if, yeah, if we do one further on the left, again, here would be a relative homology, hn plus one of x rel x2, which is, that's a comma, not a one, um, along some boundary map, delta n plus one prime, and it goes infinitely far to the left. Okay, great. Um, x2 includes into x by i2, thank you. Yes, let's be consistent in our notation, by i2. Very good. We good? So these are both long exact sequences. But not only do we have these long exact sequences, we also have some maps from the top to the bottom. Okay, what can you tell me about these two guys? x1 rel x1 intersect x2 with x rel x2. What can you tell me of these two guys? What can you tell me about those two guys? They're equivalent by excision, right? So, so the, the setup, I designed this in such a way, so on top, I just have this guy, homology of x1 rel x1 intersect x2, and on bottom, homology of x rel x2. So these are isomorphic. So there's an um, inclusion map between these that just induces an isomorphism. And likewise, these also isomorphic. So you know, these are both isomorphic. Now this, we don't have an isomorphism, and here we don't have an isomorphism either, but this is just induced by the map that includes x1 into x, including x1 into x, is just gonna be my map i1, i1 star, but it's called i1. And this is including the intersection into x2, which is called j2. j2. Okay, oh, and if I wanted to jump down here, I could also just be including this intersection into x2, which is called j2. Great. So, so there I go. And then, the commutativity of this diagram induces commutativity here, right? So this is commutative, this is an isomorphism, so these are also commutative, so this is all commutative. So here we have a nice commutative diagram. Commutative diagram. Okay, what I want to do is I now want to define a new long exact sequence from this one. And so this is gonna to be today's result. Uh, I'll state that what the long exact sequence is. We'll spend some time proving that in fact it is exact. And then we'll do a couple examples of how this thing helps us. This new exact sequence, it's called the Meyer via torus. So this is called Meyer via torus. The Meyer via torus long exact sequence. Named after two mathematicians. Um, they were both born in the late 1800s. Um, Meyer died in like 18, 1948 or something. Via torus, he, he was born in 1891. He died in 2002 at the age of 110, almost 111. So, you know, this guy had a long life, not just a centennial, but a super centennial is what you call someone who makes it to the age of 110. So really, really quite impressive. Anyway, um, it just did some good mathematics too. So this is, this is the long exact sequence. It's the sequence that maps hn plus one of x into the intersection of x1 intersect x2 into hn of x1 
sum hn with x2 and then back to just hn of x. And on and on and on it goes. And then it drops down to hn minus 1 of the intersection and so forth. OK, so let me try to describe what the maps here are. So, some are obvious, some are less so. And then we'll prove that is exact. So, OK. Um, here, I want to send x into x1 intersect x2. So I'm starting off at hn plus 1 of x, which is, ah, I don't have it. I should go back one more step, shouldn't I? Um, OK, I can extend this diagram a little bit more to the left. That's fine. We got, we got room to grow. So let me just need to extend this one step to the left because the previous guy would have been hn plus 1 of x, right? hn plus 1 of x. And we might as well extend this guy on top also. On top, he would have just been hn plus 1 of x1. hn plus 1 of x1. So again, this is just the map induced by including x1 to x. And this down here is the map that you get from going from x to this x rel x2, which you can think is like a kind of quotient map. But what I want is a map from here to hn of x1 intersect x2. So like what, what should this map be? And so I want to go from here to up here. But that's okay, I have a pathway. I just go over, I map it over with q prime. It's an isomorphism, so I can map it up. There's an inverse map, and then I just map it over. So that's going to be my map. And so I need some name you know, for this long map, and so I'm just going to call this delta of n plus 1. This is my map delta of n plus 1. And you know, over here, you would have an exactly similar map that starts off at hn of x and then goes over and up to hn minus 1 of x1 and intersect x2. And so this would be just delta n. Right, so that's similar. OK, how about x1 intersect x2? Well, you can include this in x1, and we can include this in x2. So these are inclusion maps i1 and i2. Um, OK, there's two different conventions depending on who you, uh, um, j1 and j2, right? I'm, can include this in either x1 or I can include this in x2 with the inclusion maps j1 and j2. And so um, we're going to have to follow a convention. I, I, here I'm just going to call these the maps j1 and j2. Um, Hatcher actually puts a negative sign on the second guy. Um, the signs have to work out in the end. I, I'm going to follow the convention, they're both positive. But some people instead have j1 and negative j2. That also works. Um, you can do either one of those definitions. The place it is going to be consequential is this map right here. Because now you can include your x1 piece just into x. You can include your x2 piece just into x by using inclusion maps i1 and i2. And so that. Um, for me, I'm going to put a little sign on this one. You do i1 of the x1 component. That gives you something on x minus i2 of the um, x2 component. So another convention is you make this guy negative and you make this plus. So you know, in some books, you'll see a minus here and a plus here, or a minus there, a plus there. You need it in one or the other in order for the um, exactness to follow. OK, so those, those are my maps. Those, those are my maps. All of these I could put stars on, but I'm being lazy, because it's the induced map on homology. We need to show that this is exact. right? So there's two things to show. Uh, I want to show that the kernel of each of these maps is equal to the image, which is showing that the kernel is inside the image, and the image is inside the kernel. It's always easy to show that the kernel is inside the image. Well, not always, but typically that's the easier way to go. Right? So, so ultimately what I want to show, like for this first guy, is like, let's just do the him. So it's great. 3 
guys to do. For this first one, I want to show that the, I'm sorry, the easier way to show is the image. I want to show that this image is inside of the kernel of J1, J2. But that's, that's very easy to see because if you think about, if I come here and I map up and then I do J1, well notice I've done two maps and so that's going to send me to zeros because the composition of two maps in an exact sequence is zero. But also if I come here and I go up and then I come down to J2, why is that zero? Well, that's by commutivity. Coming over and going up and going down by commutivity is the same as having just come down and gone over, which means it's the same as having just gone over twice. So traveling up and down is the same as just going over twice, but it's also zero. So when I compose these maps, I get zero. So the image of this map is in the kernel of the next one. What I need to show now is I still need to show that the kernel of J1, J2 is in the image of delta M plus one. So I'll come back and talk about that in a second. We still need to show this, but we've showed the top property. This one is inclusion is done. Over here, likewise, um, it's not hard to show that the image of J1 and J2 are in the kernel of I1 minus I2. So like, let's take a second to convince ourselves of that. So the image of J1, J2. So where am I beginning? I'm beginning, so J1, J2 means I should be beginning right here. And then what J1, J2 is going to do is it's going to map these guys over, right? So now I have just a pair, something in Hn of x1 and something in Hn of x2. But then I'm going to take i1 of this guy and subtract i2 of this guy. Why is that difference zero? Why is it that this guy minus this guy is zero? Commutivity, because it's the same as just, since this commutes, it's the same as just him subtract himself. So that just follows immediately from commutivity. Okay, I'll start writing on this in a second when I go the other direction. It's just this direction is easy enough. I don't think I have to write too much. So the harder direction to show is going to be to show that x1, i1 minus i2 is in the kernel of j1, j2. I'm sorry, the image. The, ah, what's going on? The image of j1, j2. Um, and then I guess I should do this last guy too, kind of run out of room here. But here um, I claim it's not hard to see that the image of I1 minus I2, I haven't done this one yet, no I haven't, is in the kernel, oh, okay, this has to fit. It's not hard to show that the image of I1, I2 is in the kernel of Xn. Um, did we did we get it? Okay, sorry, that's a little bit tight there. Um, so why is that? Well, if you're in the image of I1 minus I2, um, so like think like if you start here and you come along I1, what's the next map? The kernel of delta n. Yeah, so maybe for this one I should do something, you know, like, well, I think it's fine. If I, if I start out here and I come down I1, then my map, I, I should draw a delta N, shouldn't I? So recall what delta N looks like. Delta N is this map, okay? So if I start here and I come down and then I go over and I go up, by commutivity, that's the same as just mapping them up top two times. Versus if I start here, and I go over, and I go up, well, by the time you go over and over again, you're already at zero. So either way, it comes out to be zero. 
So that's why everything in this image will just be zero when you apply delta n. Okay, let's, so what we'll want to check, and I don't know if I'm gonna check all of these, you know, may, maybe some of these I'll just leave to you, but we can do as many as we find interesting. So, you know, like which, which one should we check? But let's do this first one, you know, okay. So what we need to do is we need to pick something in the kernel and then we need to show that it's also in the image. So, you know, we should let something be in the kernel. So where is J1 and J2? J1 and J2 be, are here. So this is, I'm thinking about something in HN of X1 intersect X2. So you know, let's see be in the kernel of J1, J2, which means that J1 of C is zero and J2 of C is also zero. Uh, uh, J2 of C is also zero. They both need to be mapped to zero, right? So um, this map was green, so I'm gonna do C in green. I'm gonna say C is some guy up here such that when I map it over, he goes to zero and he goes to zero. Okay, so now we can do some diagram ch chasing, right? Like this, this stuff is fun. So what I wanna show is that C is the image of something here, right? That's what, that's what I have to convince us of. And like, how could it possibly show that? So what do we have? Yeah, so this maps to zero. So he is in the kernel of J1. So since it's in the kernel of J1, C is in the image of, delta, uh, of uh, little delta n plus one. So there's something here, um, I don't know what to call it, I'll just call it B, that maps to that C, right? Now, this is an isomorphism. So if B is up here, it's isomorphic to some B prime down here. Now, what can you tell me about this B prime? By commutivity, this B prime must also be being sent to that zero, which means that because um, mapping over and down should be the same as mapping down and over, which means that B prime is in the kernel of this map. Hence, B prime is in the image of this map, so there's some A down here that maps to the B prime which means that that A maps to C in the map delta of n plus one. Isn't diagram chasing fun, right? So we just showed then delta of n plus one of some A is equal to C. So sure enough, C is in the image of delta of n plus one. So now we're done with that, great. Okay, this, this stuff's good. This stuff's like good for the soul. So let's think about this guy now. So I'm gonna begin with something in the kernel. Okay, so I need something in the kernel of I1, um, I1 minus I2. So like, where does this guy live? This, the, be a little bit careful because this thing in the kernel is an element that's actually one piece of its element is an X1 and one piece is an X2. So maybe what I'll say is like, it's some pair little X1, little X2 that's in the kernel of I1 minus I2. What that's saying, that is I1 of X1 minus I2 of X2 is zero. That's, that's my claim. Or I1 of X1 equals I2 of X2. So, so let's draw my, uh, my, um, my X1, X2, and maybe since I use that with pink, I'm gonna draw these guys in pink. So here, I'm gonna have some x1, and here is some x2, such that, such that i1 of, of, well, maybe let's just do it like this. This will map to some i2 of x2. This here maps to some i1 of x1, and they're equal to each other. The difference is zero. Okay, that's where we know about those guys. And I want to end up by saying that this is in the image of J1, J2. So I want to be able to say there's something here so that J1 maps to X1 and J2 maps to X2. That's, that's my goal in this. Okay, so why is 
Why is that true? How? Um, oh, can we map to H n x x two and then that give us zero and x two and then we multiply by some more because I'm hooking it up to get something that's already mapped. You want to map these guys over? Yeah. You get zero, then what? Then by the x So that's equivalent to some zero up here. Good. Very good. And what does that give you? Excellent. Well, that means by commutivity that he gets mapped to zero. So that means x1 is in the kernel of q. But if x1 is in the kernel of q, then it's in the image of j1. So there must be something here. What, what should I call it? y. There must be some y that maps to x1 under j1. But then by commutivity, um, this should be um, equivalent to mapping down and over, right? Um, so, um, well, you almost, I mean, so, so I don't know if you immediately know. In a second, we can show that maps to x2. Um, all we know for sure is that this is going to map down to some j2 of x2. In a second, we'll show it actually as x2. j2 of y. And that that maps to the same thing. That that maps to the same thing, um, i2 of x2. So I'm just saying i2 of j2 of y is equal to i2 of x2. But then I'm going to use that this i2 is just induced by inclusion, which means it's injective. Since this is injective, it follows that j2 of y is equal to x2. So injectivity then gives you that last bit. OK, great. So then what we showed here is there exists some y in hn of x1 intersect x2 such that j1 of y equals x1 and j2 of y equals x2. So x1, x2 is in the image of y. Great. OK, I think this last one's dumb. So this last one, you want to take something in the kernel of this map. So I'm running out of letters now. So give me a letter. Uh, have I used d? I haven't used d yet. And this is a delta map. So let's let d be in the kernel of big delta n. So what that means is delta n of d is 0. So let's, OK, so what color are we doing this guy? Yellow? Yellow. So we're going to do our d in yellow. Here our c was in green. So we're working in yellow. I have some d here that maps to 0. <laughs> what can you tell me? Well, if this maps to 0, then whatever this element here is, uh, I don't know, I could say like d maps to some e prime and some e up here. You know, d maps to that um, e prime, which corresponds to e up here. If this e maps to 0, what can you tell me about E? Well, E is in the kernel, so it must be the image of some F. But then by commutivity, since F comes here, and by the fact that this is injective, we have that F maps to D. So I think then, oh, let's, let's, uh, let me, let me be a little more careful with this. So f maps down to some i1, i1 of f. 
Okay, I want to think about like the difference between I1 of f and d. I know that I1 of f and d both map to E prime. Huh? Yeah, so, so I know that Q prime of I1 of f is equal to E prime, but that's also your Q prime of your D. I just defined E prime to be my Q prime of my D. So one way you think about this is it's saying that Q prime of I1 of f minus D has to map to zero because this is a homomorphism, right? Okay, so down here I have some creature called I1 of f minus d. And I'm saying that must be sent to zero. So what can you tell me about I1 of f minus d? It's in the kernel of him, so he must be in the image of this guy. So there's something over here, some g, have I used g? I haven't used g. That maps here, which means, that is, I2 of G is equal to I1 of F minus D. Do you see it? So what is D? Solving for D, D is I1 of F minus I2 of G. So D is the image of I1 minus I2. Man, this diagram chasing is just the best. So we just showed that then D is in the image of I1 minus I2. Okay. <sighs> Gotta be careful with chasing through this. But there we go. So this is another diagram chase. And I mean, I just find these immensely satisfying. I think you should too. But the point is we used it to give us a new long exact sequence. And so even if you didn't follow all the details, you should take away, we have this new long exact sequence when you have some x1, x2 sitting inside of x such that they cover x. So the interior of x1 union the um, interior of x2 is equal to x. So that was our setup. Our x1, x2 were sitting inside of x and x was in fact equal to the interior of x1 union the interior of x2. Good. So let's prove some things with this new long exact sequence. So um, I think we have time to do maybe two examples. The first one is something we've already seen. I think we maybe already calculated both of these, but here's how we can solve, um, calculate some homology using these long exact sequences. So for the first one, let's just calculate the homology of the spheres again. We've done this before, but I wanna show you how easy it is to calculate the homology of the spheres using Maya via torus. So your sphere is some Sn, whatever dimension you're in. What are two subspaces, x1 and x2, you could use to cover this? Yeah, the top and the bottom, or maybe more precisely, the top plus a little bit more, right? So it's like the top plus a little bit more, so a little bit past the equator. You know, it's the top plus a little bit, and it should be open. Well, I guess it doesn't matter, it's just when it, when it is open, it's, the interiors cover it. And then like the, the bottom plus a little bit more. So we'll have like the bottom plus a little bit more. So it's essentially the northern southern hemisphere of like plus epsilon on the other end, right? Add a little bit of epsilon. Okay, so um, here's your x1 on top. Here's your x1 on top. Here's your x2 on bottom. Your x is just the whole sphere, Sn. And you tell me what is x1 intersect x2? Well, it's the equator, or deformation retracts into the equator, so it's a little bit thickened up, which is equivalent to just Sn minus one, right? So now let's look what our long exact sequence gives us. So we're gonna use this long exact sequence now, and we get, um, so I'll just, I'll begin here. Um, Hn of x1 direct sum Hn of x2 maps onto Hn of Sn 
drops down a degree to hn minus 1 of sn minus 1 of the intersection maps to H1, uh, hn minus 1, n minus 1 of x1 directs some um, h n minus 1 of x2. And I could, I could keep going in either direction, in both directions, as much as I want. But this is all I need because what is hn of either x1 or x2? Well, the top of the bottom is disk. And since so the disk, they're contractible. So the homology is trivial. So this has just trivial homology. And this is also trivial homology. But since this is a long exact sequence, what does that tell us? It tells us that hn of sn is isomorphic to hn minus 1 of, a, of sn minus 1. So now we understand how homology of the spheres works. Okay? Um, so I was just recovering that key result. We could go and think about like h0 and all that, but that, that's the key insight of how quickly it is to recover that. So you can just bootstrap it up, use an induction from my via torus. Let me do one more example. The last couple of minutes we have to show you uh, maybe how things might get slightly more tricky, how you really have to sometimes pay attention to what the maps are. For the second example, and I think we did this last time with cellular homology, we just calculated it from the cell structure, but here we can calculate it using Maya via torus. Let's think about the Klein bottle. So recall how we can build the Klein bottle. The Klein bottle can be built so that you're just gluing together this side A with this side A and this side B with this side B where you put in a twist. Oh, okay, sorry. B, where we put in a twist, right? So you just put in a little twist and you cap it off. Okay. Um, how are we gonna decompose this into two different spaces? Um, lots of ways you might try to do it, but the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to think about it like this. Here you have one region. Here, this A glues to this A. So if you prefer, you could draw this as, you know, it's slanted now. B slanted A, and there's this little guy in between where this portion of B is getting glued to that portion of B, and this portion of B is getting glued. Oh, did I draw it right? Um, I can take this off, glue it here. Well, this is a little bit deceptive because, you know, it's like, hmm. Like, he's getting glued to him. He's getting glued to him. But you still have this line. Okay, so, so this is a little bit hard to draw. Um, think about tracing this line. As you travel along this line, you continue here. This is all just one line. So that whole line, it's gluing this whole, you know, this whole part right here is getting glued to this edge right here. Those are being glued together. But then as you keep traveling, you're now back over here, so this part is also being glued right here. So it might be kind of weird what's going on here, but I'm saying like if you think of this as being, I need colors now, if you think of this as being one of your regions, and you'll spill over a little epsilon, but this is one of the guys spilling over a tiny bit. And then this is the other one. So you have some, this is like your X1, 
and this is your x2, your x1 and x2 are both just Mobius bands. But the Mobius bands are glued along the circle that's on the edge of the Mobius band. So, so, like if, so, so these are, this is two Mobius bands. This is two Mobius bands. So like, let me show this one other way. You can think of this green guy. I'm gonna try and draw a Mobius band here. So we'll see how it goes. You're not allowed to get a PhD in math until you can draw a Mobius band. Hey, I think this is a pretty good Mobius band. I think it's a pretty nice Mobius band. Okay, it's got a little bit fat on the edges, but you know, it's winter time, so okay. So, so like this is the edge of the Mobius band. The circle that goes around the edge of the Mobius band, you can think kind of traces around to one side, but you might think of it as like two sides. It traces, it's like that's the circle, that's the yellow circle. So I'm gluing this Mobius band along that yellow band to the other one. So I'm gluing together the two Mobius bands along the circle that goes along the outside. Okay? Okay. So, and, and if you want, you can color this. Like one of these would be color green. And then we could draw a second Mobius band that we color yellow, uh, orange, that's been glued together along the yellow boundary. And that's a good climb button. So, so you can think of your X1 as just this Mobius band, as X2 as just a Mobius band. But both of these, you know, a Mobius band just deformation retracts onto its core. So if you think of its core as just being this line along the center, then both X1 and X2 just deformation retract onto a circle, onto S1, right? So the homology of a, of a Mobius band is just the homology of, of a circle. Just S1. So let's go ahead now and calculate our homology for this guy. So we have H2 of the Klein bottle should map onto, um, this is like H2 of this thing. Um, you, you could do H2 of higher things as well, like um, before it would have been H2 of H2 of X1 with h2 of x2, but I'm saying these are both just circles, so that's just zero. So th this whole thing here, this is just zero because there's no h2 to an s1. Because both retract onto just s1. So h2 of the Klein bottle will map onto h1 of the intersection, while the intersection of the two Mobius bands is just this yellow circle. So the intersection is just the yellow copy of s1. And then we want to think that that maps onto H1 of one copy of a Mobius band, which you can think of as just the deformation tracks onto that core circle S1. Some H1 of the other Mobius band, which also deformation tracks onto its core circle S1. And then finally, that's going to map onto H1 of the Klein bottle. And if you want to keep going, then you'll go to um, H0 of the intersection, um, H0 of this intersection. Okay, if we're working in, um, if we work in reduced homology, we'll just treat H0 as zero if we're going to work in reduced homology. So otherwise H0 would also be a copy of Z. So, but we're working in reduced homology, so you have zeros at the ends. Okay, um, so let's try and figure out what's going on with this homology. What is this map here? This is the map to its intersection. Like maybe that's not a easy map, so we'll have to come back and think about what this map is. What's this map? Well, like, this is just a Z. And this is the, a z squared. But what is this map between them? It's mapping this circle of the boundary onto its core. One copy 
of this boundary goes to, well, it's just including that. And then, you know, deformation track down to its core. But one of these yellow circles goes to how many pink circles? Two. So this is actually mapping to two in both, in both Mobius spans. Right? It's mapping to two times your core circle. Okay. Um, based on how you orient these things, one of these might be minus. It, it won't matter for the final answer, but you have to be careful with uh, thinking about orientation. Maybe it's two and minus two. Um, it, it won't matter here. But that's this map. So what is the kernel of this map? Empty. No kernel. Kernel is zero. Which means the image of this map is zero. Right? This kernel is zero, so this image is zero. So this right here is just the map um, J1, J2. J1, J2. And the kernel of that map is zero because only the zero gets sent to zero, zero. Which means the image of this map is zero. So this is the map delta n plus one. And I'm just pointing out that since the kernel of J1, J2 is empty, so is the image of delta, uh, delta two in this case, delta two, delta two. But this map is an injection because this is zero. So H2 of K is equal to its image. It's isomorphic to its image. So H2 of K, since this is zero, this has to be an injection, H2 of K must just be zero. So there's one observation. But you only get that from understanding this map. Okay, second observation is we know that this H1 of K should be isomorphic to this z plus z modded out by the image of this map, modded out by the image of j1, j2. Because we have a zero here. This is a short exact sequence. So it's just this guy mod out by its image. But what is z plus z? Well, one basis you could select for z cross z, there are several possible bases. Maybe you're thinking about the basis like one, zero, and zero, one. But then like, what do you do with the relation mod out by two, two is zero? Like, how can you simplify this? So think of an alternative basis. An alternative basis for z, z is one, zero, and one, one. That's another perfectly good basis, right? But now you can see that you end up with, from this first basis element, a copy of z, and from the second one, just a z2, because we need double it at zero. And so now we've calculated what h1 of the client model is. So this is how my Viatoris, by thinking about what the maps are, these very easy maps, these inclusion maps, can help you understand, help you calculate the homology of a space. So I'll stop there.